Okay. Can I jump off now and go to your page? Yes, you can go to my page now. That'd be okay. wonderful. All right. And I'm getting ready to introduce everybody here. Okay. Facebook people, we are here at Comic Spot. This is Linda Marcus Smith, your host. And today we have Mike Rowe. I have to take off my post because I had the wrong Mike Rowe. This Mike Rowe is just as important and he's accomplished a heck of a lot of things. So you ought to know him as well. Many of you probably know him instead of the other one. So it's a win-win either way. I'm telling you, there are no bad Mike Rose. <laughs> I found that out today. Oh my gosh, egg on my face. I'm gonna read you the introduction I have for our guest today. Where did you go? You're not here, my guest. <laughs> my guest isn't here. I'm sure you'll be coming back soon. Let me ask him what happened. <laughs> this here he is. He's back. Awesome. <laughs> I'm here. Hi, it's the right Mike Rowe. There is no wrong one. All That's righty. Right. <laughs> so let me read you the introduction we have for our guest today on Comic Spot. Mike Rowe in the other square with the Boston hat. Is that for Boston or Baltimore? I think it's a Brooklyn Dodgers, an old timey hat. Oh my gosh. Way back. But it's much cheaper than a hairpiece, you see. <laughs> So Mike Rowe, his intro is that he started comedy in the 80s. He did start at stand-up during the boom, the big boom. You've heard of it. This big boom was big. And he did it for 10 years in that beginning stage when everything was going amazing with comedy. And then he went to Hollywood and started writing for sitcoms. You've heard of them. The Nanny, Coach. Beck, Beck, was it Beck? Becker, Becker, Ted Danson, Becker. Becker. It's already a thousand years ago, it feels like. But yeah. I loved all of those shows. The Nanny, Coach. I even saw a film, a filming, a taping of Coach. Oh, wow. Yes, wow. I love that show. I'm into sports. I know it could, you could tell from the fact that I recognized your hat. That's right. <laughs> and... Uh, and now he's gone into animation. You know him from work that he's done on Futurama and Family Guy. This guy is somebody in the business. Let's get to know him. Welcome to the Good. stage, Mike Rowe. Hi, Mike. Good to be here. I feel like I should do a couple of bits or something. I, I haven't done stand-up in, uh, boy, it feels like 100 years, but uh, I really, I stopped in the 90s, except I have twin boys who are, who uh, they're in their 20s now, early 20s. And at one point I realized they had never seen me do stand up. So I like two years ago, did a set after not doing it for 15 or however long years and did it just so my sons can see me live. Oh. And luckily it went very well. In fact, they brought all their friends with them. So the pressure was on. Um, but it went great. Their friends were laughing and impressed. And I was the coolest dad around for uh, a whole year. Oh, now what city do you live in? I'm in Studio City uh, here in uh, Los Angeles. Are you in Los Angeles? I'm in Vegas. Holy cannoli. I'm in the part where we have the San Francisco Bridge. Oh, I see. <laughs> uh, nice view there. Yeah. Um, I'm originally from a small factory town in Connecticut. Oh. That's called Waterbury. And uh, I was 17 years old. Then uh, this was back in the day before stand up comedy, where every building had like a comedy showcase place. And this was way before that. But I was so hungry to do stand up, I would just wander into these bars. I wasn't even legally allowed to be there. I would find the manager 
and tell them when the band has a break, I just, can I just go up to the microphone and talk? <laughs> and they let me do it, you know? Uh, I had a blast. It was, it was kind of a great way to, you know, I think I, think I skipped the, uh, the teens where most teens are drinking and, you know, smoking. And I was, I was just a comedy nerd. You know, that's the best place to do comedy because you're not doing it for other comics. Yes. Yeah, they really let you know. Yeah. And I used to love, you know, back then too, it was hard to find comedians on TV. You know, it'd be The Tonight Show. And back then there was like Don Kirshner's rock concert and those kind of things. They would put a comedian on like at the end. And so I was just hungry to find comedians. But uh, I, would, I would record them with my little cassette recorder and then just study them, you know, and just learn the, the rhythms and the whole thing and pull it apart. And, uh, but my favorite was Rodney Dangerfield. Really? As a kid, yeah. And I would memorize his jokes. And there was a 17 year old kid, you know, telling these jokes to his friends. I'm doing like jokes about my wife and my lawyer, you know, but <laughs> a joke's a joke. And uh, so one night, Johnny Carson got Rodney Dangerfield to talk like to personal, be personal for once. And, and he talked about when he started, uh, he was also working full time doing aluminum siding during the day, uh, but he was working the Catskill Mountains and uh, he went by the name of Jack Roy. That was his stand-up name at the time. And then I also learned that he had a comedy club in Manhattan called Dangerfields. So I got this idea of like, since I knew his jokes so well, and I knew the rhythm and I knew the personality, I got my mom's rickety old typewriter and I typed out like two pages of jokes because I knew I could send them to Jack Roy at Dangerfields and he would probably see them. And I'm like 17 in my, you know, finished off panel bedroom basement, you know, but typed these things out and sent them. And of course, you know, weeks go by and it's like, all right, you know, I kind of forgot about it. But then uh, one night the phone rings, my mom up the top of the stairs is like, Mike, there's a Rodney on the phone for you. <laughs> like, what? I'm, you know, like, hello, hello. Hey Mike, it's Rodney, how you doing? You okay, you all right? Hey, how are you? you know, and I'm like, like what the? <laughs> You know, yeah, I got your jokes. You know, they're pretty good. You know, I like them, you know, but they're not for me, but they're funny, you know? And uh, he kept me on the phone, like, for 20 minutes, you know, saying that I was funny. And then I started to tell him I wanted to do stand-up. And he told me about the comedy clubs, you know, and uh, he said, I, you know, don't come to my club. It's no good, you know, but, and he told me, you know, back then, all the big showcase clubs, there was the improv, Catch a Rising Star, a comic strip, you know, the comic strip. And uh, so, and then he sent me a letter, like a week later, a handwritten letter of like, it's gonna take a long time to learn how to be funny, you know? Um, so as a kid, you know, that was a great encouragement, you know, to like, okay, I guess if Rodney says I'm funny, <laughs> you know? And uh, before you know it, I was on a bus headed to uh, New York, just out of high school. Oh my gosh. Um, it was funny too, because I, I didn't go to college. I wasn't planning on it. I was at a trade school <laughs> for high school. I, I told everybody it was so my parents would know what kind of work I'd be out of. <laughs> um, but it's funny too, because, you know, I ended up in a trade school because, it, you know, this is a lesson for everyone. Like, I don't know who it was, but people told me I was not college material. I was deemed, you know, and uh, so I ended up in a trade school, but I, uh, out of high school, I ended up working for NASA. I worked on the space shuttle for like a year. Um, and it was just crazy. It, there was this, this division of NASA in Danbury, Connecticut. But uh, so I guess, you know, you have to be careful when people try to label you, you know, because uh, some people take it to heart and maybe would think that's who they are, you know? Absolutely. And doctors are good at doing, not just teachers and educators or family members, 
I, I suffered brain trauma in 96 from a drunk driver. And they said that I'd never learn again. And they weren't going to help me rehabilitate. So I rehabilitated my own brain and made it into the contestant pool of who wants to be a millionaire. Oh, wow. I beat out a rocket scientist that day. You're not mad at me, are you? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I'm hardly a rocket scientist. But, um, but I... Uh, and a lot of it is in my book that I have carefully placed over my shoulder. It's called, It's a Funny Thing. How where, the- uh, where you buy it? That's on Amazon. Okay. Um, but it has all these stories, but I think it's a good book for anyone who just wants to learn a little bit about perseverance, you know, and chasing whatever your dreams are and how to get through and put up with and learn how to get over all the the stumbling blocks that are going to happen you know wow um because it's a it, show business obviously obviously rough and you get your ass kicked a lot but you learn you have to learn how to get through it and that's kind of i think what makes people successful and not successful you know uh Show business is really about getting rejected most of the time and getting rejected forwards, I guess. Yes. What's the saying? If if you're falling flat on your face, at least you're moving forward, right? <laughs> That's a good line. Yeah. Um, I've been nominated for six Emmys, I think, you know, and I finally won one, you know, and congratulations. Thanks. Again, I had a team of people carefully place it over my other shoulder. They came in, lighting guy. It's a whole complicated thing. Um, but in truth, you know, I don't, I don't even know exactly what the Emmy means in the industry, but I just like it as, you know, when I was a naive kid starting into business, I was thinking like, yeah, I can win an Emmy someday. So just it being that sort of kid-like fantasy, but then it actually happening, that was kind of more important to me. And it's kind of you know, for my parents, and I guess it's also for the the sports trophies I never won in a way. So there's that aspect, you know. Um, so, were you a sports nut? I wasn't at all. That's the thing, you know. I think what I didn't do in sports, I did in comedy. The way you know, as kids would, you know, watch sports with their dad. My dad and I used to watch stand-up comics all the time and laugh. I mean, that was kind of our connection. I mean, my dad was a sports guy, <clears throat> but we would watch, you know, comedians that would show up on Carson and, and you know, Merv Griffin, uh, stuff like that, even as far back as Ed Sullivan, I think, when I was a little tiny kid. So, uh, right, uh, um, Henny Youngman was very prominent in my relationship with my dad, you know, <clears throat> um, he just loved those corny, quick one-liners. And my dad owned a, a really crappy bar in my hometown. And I would hang out there as a kid. And I started to learn about comedy through the camaraderie of those people that hung out at the bar. A lot of, uh, my dad had like a bunch of softball teams, you know, in the, in the, in the beer leagues and stuff like that. But a lot of college students and just kind of seeing the power of humor through that, just laughing and having a good time. And my dad would always throw out Roddy Day, or uh, Henny Youngman jokes, right? Um, so uh, on my dad's 60th birthday, I, uh, through a friend, I got in touch with Henny Youngman and I hired him to show up at my dad's birthday party. And it was crazy, you know, he, he had a basement party, you know, with 80 of his people he, and relatives he's known forever. And uh, he, it was a surprise. And I said, you know, I got a friend here who wanted to stop by from New York. And it's in my dad's basement, you know. <laughs> and then I introduced Henny Youngman. And he comes down the stairs with his loud jacket and his violin. <laughs> And he went at it and my dad, like, he like stood up and spun around in, in, in excitement. I mean, it, it was kind of, especially in a small town, you know, where, you know, if you see like the local weatherman, you know, 
crossing the street. It's like a celebrity sighting. But to have Henny Youngman show up at your house, I mean, he was, it really, I mean, he remembered that obviously for the rest of his life and even kind of became friends with him. They would talk on the phone once in a while, you know. So that was cool. That was fun. That's so special. Yeah. Well, talk to me about the things that you got to accomplish in your comedy. I know you became an animator and you're very accomplished there, but how did the first time you went and did comedy and then you got sort of getting gigs and funny things that you have some funny stories or lessons that you learned? Um, or do we need to buy your book? I'll, I'll give you a little, uh, it's funny, you know, too, my book, I've, a, a lot of people have read it and I've only, it's only been out for not even a week. And uh, I, so far it's like, you know, relatives and friends have been buying it, but I've yet to hear from people who don't know me read it. That's going to be the curious thing. Are people going to, I mean, I really tried to write it, you know, to be all inclusive, you know, and it's sort of like a, a, a coming of age book. You know, it's, it's kind of my version of like the TV show, the wonder years. It's like this, it's not just like I hang out with celebrities and it was fun. It was like all these challenges that I had to, to kind of do. Um, the first time I did stand up ever was at the high school talent show, which was a little scary because it's like everybody, the whole student body. I'm really good. I'm basically kind of a shy person, you know, and, and that's how people kind of knew me pretty much at the school, uh, except I was comfortable at the lunch table with my electronics class. I was in, I took electronics. But that was the first time I did stand up. And my mom knew, like, I was so shy that she didn't even tell friends or anybody because she thought I was going to just crash and burn. She didn't want people to get, you know, in the way of that disaster. But she came and I went up. And because I was such a fan of comedy and because I studied it so much, I did really well. People really liked it. My mom was like, who is that guy on stage? I didn't know him. And that was really the start of it. That, that first like, you know, charge of excitement of getting laughs of the, the fantasizing about it for years and watching comics and then finally feeling that feeling it's, it's the, the drug is in your system, you know? Um, I'm trying to think of any silly anecdotes or crazy. Uh, I, uh, I opened for uh, Kenny G years and years ago in New York City at a big music club. And uh, we did uh, a weekend. We did uh, Friday and Saturday night, two shows a night. And uh, I like how my chain, I feel like uh, my face is like a mood ring. Like <laughs> it's red now. Changing colors. Either that, like. <laughs> If it turns yellow, I think it means it's going to rain. <laughs> then if, I don't. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I'm uh, working with Kenny G, and uh, <clears throat> you know we got I got we got to know each other, and so the uh, second the fr after the first show on a Saturday night, we had I had this giant dressing room with the whole bathroom and the whole thing, and he has his one on the other side of the hall, and between shows, I'm looking down his hallway, and he has a big party going on, right? And it's celebrities, food, and like hangers on. And like, <laughs> and I'm like in my doorway in my dressing room and I'm trying to get his attention. I wanna get invited to the party, you know? And I'm like waiting for him to see me, you know? And we finally sees me and he goes and, you know, kind of jogs over to my door there. And he's like, hey, Mike, uh, I got a, a big party going on in my dressing room. Is it okay if I take a crap in here? Oh. Uh, oh. Kenny. Um, there was one time I, you know, I used to work at the Ed Sullivan, Ed Sullivan Theater, right? Yes. Uh, there was a TV show called Kate and Alley. Yes. I don't know if you remember that. Yes. So I was the audience warm up guy. I was in charge of like wrangling them, and keeping them updated on the stories, and trying to be funny and taking questions and answers. And uh, the audience spotted one of the crew guys doing a hacky sack. You remember hacky sack? Yeah. And then uh, he, uh, someone from the audience said, Can that guy come on stage in the middle of the stage and do the hacky sack thing for us? And we'll, and I said, 
Uh, all right, I said, I'm gonna introduce him. And I said, but I'm gonna stand where Ed Sullivan used to stand. And I said, I'm gonna do my lame Ed Sullivan impression. I said, but every time I say the Beatles, you have to scream as loud as you can. <laughs> and I was like, all right, before we bring out the Beatles. And then they screamed and it was such a weird, like I got a chill, you know, it was like a recreation of that uh, moment. I mean, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I, I worked with a woman who was on the show that night or she and her husband were a comedy team. And she said, uh, the dressing rooms, the windows faced, faced 53rd Street. And it was obviously just teeming with teenage girls just screaming, just taking up the whole block. And my friend is standing, looking out the window with John Lennon. And uh, she goes to him, what do you think of this? And he just goes, oh, they're here for Ringo. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was cool. Um, <laughs> what else? Um, did I scribble anything? Uh, I do remember uh, when I started uh, stand up here, when I got to California at the improv, I was getting more and more writing work. And, but I was still doing the, the stand up because I did, was just a nice, you know, even if it's late night, you kind of get a sense of like a little bit of comedy nourishment from audiences laughing because the transition from doing stand up comedy then to becoming a writer and working in a writer's room, uh, it's not as, you know, exciting. You know, you're doing stand up, you get rolling laughs, hopefully, or at least you, there's that dialogue with an audience of set up punchline. But in a writer's room, it's just a little more intimate. So it's like, instead of a laugh, the, the response is, oh, yeah, that's funny. Let's do that. You know, it's, so it was good to be on stage once in a while. Yes. Um, but I, could, I felt it start to, uh, I just started to felt I was starting to disconnect from it a little bit, especially like, you know, I would, it was sometimes I'd get on late and it was no longer fun to hang out at the improv like it was in New York. And as, as you get pushed back later, you just kind of felt like you were, you know, waiting, you know, for a flight that's been delayed or something. But, uh, but I do remember one night I got on and I think like one of the Wayne's brothers went on for like an hour and now it's like, you know, almost one in the morning and there's eight people left and I'm on next. And I'm, so I did what I used to do in New York. And I don't know if I can really explain this moment, but you know, so I'm on stage and I, you know, I, in New York, I would play around with some ideas, do jokes that I've done forever, and then kind of chat it up and search around for new jokes and just, you know, the improv in New York was always sort of a comedy gymnasium. So I just kind of did that. And then um, it was weird when I got off stage, the guy who ran the sound system or the lights or whatever he did, just kind of came up to me as if I was like going to kill myself or something he was like comforting in an odd way and he goes and this is after i've been doing it for 10 years and he goes you know what don't worry about it you do it for a few years you'll figure it out and i was like i felt it was weird i you know i felt the stand-up person i almost visually saw the ghost of my stand-up leave my body and go through the roof of the club and i didn't do stand-up again after that I just, it, it went away, except for that one time with my sons, but it just, it was like a spirit that left. It was very odd, you know? I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. But I did get to work with people I idolized. Uh, in the early 80s, Andy Kaufman came back to the New York Improv and hung out with us. And he got to know me and trust me and he let me play the drums for him when he did Elvis. That was fantastic. And then he let me referee one of his wrestling matches. What? He, uh, so he told me, he said, look, I'm going to, he said, there's going to be a real woman from the audience. Um, and the offer was a thousand dollars wrestle me. And if you can pin me down, you get a thousand dollars. And I, I didn't know how to referee. I just kind of like, 
was on stage with, and the stage of the improv was the size of a lunchbox, you know. And I don't know, you know, if you remember Andy during those days when he did that, but he was, you know, certainly nothing you can get away with today. Not that he even got away with it then, but it was like, you know, women should be home cooking and cleaning and doing the ironing. And the women were getting like furious. Like they were running to the edge of the stage. Like it was almost like a wall of ladies, like wanting to kill him. But this little spry woman came from the audience to, and she says, I'll take you down. And, uh, and I'm like, it's getting really scary and somebody can get hurt. And he's like flipping this woman like a pancake, just tossing her around and she's like into it. And it was a real audience member. So at one point, yeah, I just had to call it. I, you know, he had her down at one point. I don't know if, if she officially lost, but it, I just had to like, you know, uh, call it before somebody gets hurt. Yes. Um, but I felt privileged. He, he actually confided in me because he would keep in character always, even with us, like he was wearing the neck brace still, you know, the wrestling neck brace. But he, uh, he went on Letterman at the time and started, uh, when he was talking to David, he started sort of crying and sniveling. And Letterman's like, what's going on? He goes, they fired me from Taxi, from the TV show Taxi. I can't, they won't let me go on anymore. I never saved up any money. And, you know, he's unshaven. And, uh, and then it gets kind of ugly and he wants people in the audience to give him money and then security pulls him off the stage and it was all preset you know but it was kind of cool that the next night I saw him he said they really believed it they thought it was true um so it was kind of cool that he I feel privileged that he broke character and told me on that thing you know there's so, there's so much that's special about Andy Kaufman that people today don't know. Yeah, yeah. What uh, else is remarkable about him? What's that? What else would you say is remarkable about him since you knew him? Well, um, what was interesting is his partner who was named Bob Zamuda a lot of the times he was, uh, he was the lounge singer. He was Tony Clifton, where people were supposed to think it was actually Andy. But Bob Zamuda was kind of instrumental in how Andy kind of approached a lot of those stunts because uh, Bob Zamuda worked as an assistant for the screenplay writer. Uh, I forget, Jerry Wexler, his last name is Wexler, but he wrote Saturday Night Fever and he wrote a movie called Joe but he was this pretty big time screenwriter, but he was nuts. And Bob Zamuda was his assistant. But when he was writing a, a script, he did this thing where like, if he's writing a scene and it's say in an art gallery and there needed to be an art, uh, an argument between the, 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 the artist and a customer or something like that. So what they would do is the writer would take Bob Zamuda to an art gallery in real life Bob Zamuda would have a tape recorder and then the writer would actually start an argument with the artist and Bob Zamuda would record it and then he would take it back and that would be his first draft for that scene. So that's how Bob Zamuda got into this thing of like going in and aggravating people and making it these moments. And he kind of shared that with Andy and got him on that train, you know. Um, Write a story. So what, what you like the improv in New York, what other clubs did you like doing in New York? Well, one of the fun things about, first of all, like Andy Kaufman and the improv, he, he also kind of changed my way of thinking and using the improv more as kind of a, a creative space other than stand up. And, uh, I was friends with Ray Romano and I still am, but Ray was unknown at the time. And I was the MC that night. And I did this thing with Ray where I seated him in the audience and I just kind of said, oh, we have a special guest in the audience tonight. He's from the Broadway show. And I made up a name of the show and I made up his name as this actor. 
welcome so and so and I got the audience to, to applaud the spotlight went over to him. He did his showbiz bow and people were like, I get, I get, you know, and then later on in the show, I sat him in another part of the audience. And then I said, we got another star here tonight from, you know, I made up a sitcom name and made up another actor name. And then the light swings over and Ray takes another bow and they applaud and they go, wait, no. And I, then I did it a third time, why not? <laughs> Later, but we have a movie star guest here with us. <laughs> um, but the, the improv really became my, it, it just started to make me think more of as a writer. Uh, I found a uh, golf clubs in the coat check room so me and another another comic, uh, he put on the thing. He was my caddy, and we played through the room during the show. <laughs> oh my gosh! It's just fun stuff like that. I loved. You know, there were times I would just walk in the room, and the improv was, you know, it was kind of a shithole. It had, you know, exposed wiring and pipes and air conditioning. So I would just kind of walk in the room with a clipboard and look around and just kind of look concerned and take notes just about somebody was on stage just to be <laughs> annoying <laughs> looking at all the things they need to fix that's right like something <laughs> could blow up any minute <laughs> but uh yeah i got to uh work with the uh, open for a bunch of different bands uh, i uh i did a show with eric clapton that was it was the TV show called Night Music. Uh, David Sanborn hosted it. Night Music? Yeah. And uh, so I was, I had a reputation of, as a good audience warm up guy. They found me, they needed me for one night. And so there's a bunch of other bands there, but I thought like, cause I, I play the drums and I, we, me and some other comics had this, this kind of band, we would just get together. There were rehearsal spaces in New York city. You can, uh, you can go in and pay $20 an hour and then you'd have everything set up and everything. And we were playing and it, cause in fact, it was a new Clapton album out at the time and we were playing those songs. And, uh, so I'm like, well, of course I want to do it. It's Clapton. I want to, you know, so I, I never do this, but I was like, I want to get, I want to get an autograph. I mean, I, the celebrities album for, I don't really do that, but, um, but, uh, uh, there was a moment where in the beginning before the audience came in, they uh, wanted me to do a sound check, you know, and so I'm at center stage and finding where my audience is going to be. And then behind me, Clapton comes out with Robert Cray. I don't know if you know that blues guitar player, Robert Cray. And they start playing and I'm like the only person in the room. And then I sit down at the piano bench and I'm like, you know, four feet away. And they're almost like playing for me and they're trading off blues. And I'm just like, you know, arm's length of watching them do this. So uh, I figured that would help me, you know, when I go in the dressing room later and in, in, in the green room and ask for an autograph. And I, so I kind of, you know, looking for my right moment. And then I kind of go in and I shook his hand too. And his hand was like, you know, 12 inches long, just these long fingers, but mm -hmm. I, I kind of, you know, asked for an autograph and he was, <laughs> you know, he was happy. But just as I was about to do it, some person who works there just like almost dragged me out and started yelling at me with, people do not ask celebrity for autograph. And Clapton's like looking around and I'm like, I don't know. And then, so uh, it wasn't until the end of the night uh, and everybody pretty much had gone and I was kind of headed out. And then Clapton came out with a group of people from the green room, they were leaving. And they were standing there kind of talking together. And then he spotted me. And then he said goodbye to everyone and everybody left because he came over to me. And he said, you still want that autograph. But just as he left, a giant monitor fell from the ceiling exactly where he was standing. It was like a plane had crashed through the building. I mean, it was exactly where he's standing. And I said, you know, you were, you came here and left there just at, before that thing fell. And I said, I think I saved your life. <laughs> and, and then he jokingly, like he took out cheap music and signed it for me. And I said, thanks for saving my life, <laughs> Eric Clapton. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, that was pretty cool. That's something you never forget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's plug your book. 
Yes, it's so a funny. It's a funny thing. Uh, you're my first book plug person. Wonderful. But it's a uh, how the professional comedy business made me fat and bald. <laughs> uh, forward by Bob Odenkirk. Wow. Uh, Larry David gave it a nice plug on the top, and Matt Groening and Sarah Silverman, Ray Romano. Wow. Um, they all seem to really like it. You know, there's even little pictures and the whole rigmarole. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know who's going to buy it. I don't know who, how, you know, besides relatives. But it, it, the purpose of it was. You know, when I thought about doing stand up when I was 16, 17, it's kind of the book that I would have loved to have found because it just is all the inside of what that journey is and what are the kind of things you can expect if you're going to go after this. You know, and at the same time, it's, it's going after anything that you think is impossible. You know what I mean? And what happens when you face those challenges, you know? So, um, but it also has just some fun behind the scenes things and, and what it's like to work with your heroes and stuff like that. And um, one of my favorite sketch shows was SCTV. And then I got to work with uh, Martin Short, uh, who was the host of it. Don't tell me that, he's my favorite. And he was fantastic and he was great. He would hang out with the writers at lunchtime and he was bringing in all the SCTV people to do sketches with him. So I'd be sitting there with Edith Prickley and they'd be in costume, you know, it was, uh, uh, although I almost killed him, by the way. You did? I, uh, I wrote this little cold opening sketch where he was late for the show and he had to get there to do the monologue and the audience was waiting and he was in a cab. Uh, Artie Lang was the cab driver. And uh, so he's speeding to work, but since he had a camera in the cab, uh, inexplicably, I don't know why he had a camera, but he had the news, this is how long ago, was he had a newspaper, and, he, and he's, he's flipping through the news, newspaper trying to come up with jokes from the headlines on the, on the fly. Uh, here's the start, and, and the, you know, trying to, and then he, he pulls up outside the studio, and then we go live, that was pre-tape, and then he looks like it's continuous where he goes running full speed into the stage, into the, uh, uh, you know, where the audience is to do his monologue. And he ran part past this part where there was a short curtain and he didn't know there was a metal bar behind it. And he hit it at full speed. And you can hear like, a, almost like a cartoon ping when his head hit it. And he was like, you know, and they just went right to a commercial. And he said, there was a moment where he just, blacked out <laughs> Whoa, that's um, you've got that was good blast. stories in the business yes um just i love that i got to you know it's it's a feeling of almost like you know getting to walk into the television of like you know and even as a little kid there was a show called soupy sales yes loved him and that was the first thing I remember laughing at, you know, I was five or whatever. And Soupy later on in the eighties did stand up. He had like a one man show kind of thing. And I somehow got to open for him for Soupy sales. So it's like, you know, I mean, he's a real person. He, you know, it's not a fake TV thing. So, uh, it's just big, was this big comedy venue in New Jersey. And uh, um, as I walk into this big green room, it's like, I'm going to meet Soupy Sales, the guy that, the first guy that made me laugh. And as I walk in, the bathroom door opens and Soupy comes out. And the first thing he says is like, oh, you got any matches? I just took a big shit in there. <laughs> <laughs> My hero. <laughs> it was like, uh, I ended up writing jokes for Rodney Dangerfield and uh, I would go to his club during the day and he had like a, his dressing room in the basement. Yep. And uh, I was, you know, this 18 year old kid with my little jokes, reading them and Rodney's wearing a robe and he's just pacing. And I'm like, oh, I'm so bad. And then he like, finally he stopped. I'm like, oh, maybe I hit, is this a 
and then he turned around and started peeing in the sink. I'm right. like, they don't give me a toilet in here, you know, I gotta pee in the sink. It's like, oh, I'm in showbiz. <laughs> he didn't get any respect, not even in his own club. <laughs> That's right. Wow, that's a story. Holy Toledo. Yeah. Well, your book, where else can people follow you or help promote you? Um, I mean, I'm on Facebook, you know. Um, I just sort of got into the promotional world just now. Um, you know, I'm curious to see what happens you know it's a weird thing like part of i think what's brought me whatever success i have is just kind of following my instincts and just going for it so that's kind of why the book got written you know so whatever happens happens but uh i felt like too though if it inspires like one young kid to read it and say you know what i kind of get what it is. And if it's sort of inspirational, then I feel like that's even better. And then the funny thing is that my sons read it and then they both decided they want to be in show business. <laughs> that's so great. Yeah. So I have one son who started doing stand up just before the pandemic. And then my other son is getting into production. So, you know, I guess my job is done <laughs> with the book. I don't even have to sell anymore. <laughs> <laughs> In truth, I don't even know how many, how many will be like. I don't even know what the charts on Amazon mean. I don't know if, I don't know if I sold nine copies or a hundred and two. <laughs> but you know, I don't know if it matters. Well, I'm gonna check it out on Amazon, and I might go ahead and buy one. Yeah, yeah, it's a good, it's a good fast read. You know, it's also uh, good to have around if you. Us comedians, we find people all the time that are thinking about doing comedy. It's also good here, borrow this and then make a decision. Yeah, it, it certainly will help. You know, it's like if you really want to do it, you know, you'll get your butt kicked along the way, but you know, it could be worth it. You know, it's, I mean, it's like anything else, you know, it's, it's funny, my dad who was in real estate would say, you know, well, you don't know when your next stand-up gig's going to come. You don't know when your next writing job's going to come. But I'm like, how how is real estate different? I mean, you don't know when you're going to sell your next house, you know? So it's it's all connected. It's all relatable, I think, you know? Yeah. So what do you want to accomplish for the rest of your life? You have two grown children. Um. I mean, I'm still uh, developing shows. Uh, I just show, sold an animated series with David Cross. Uh, I'm doing animated Christmas musical with Jason Mraz, you know, uh, Jason Mraz. And Nancy Cartwright is doing the voice. Uh, she does Bart Simpson's voice. And uh, Allison Janney is in it. Um, I adore Allison Janney. Yeah. And then uh, what else? Um, um, looks like I might be developing this thing for Jack Black, another animated thing, you know. So it's just, uh, it's it's still always a fight. You know, it's like, you gotta have so many things on the runway and just keep pushing. And, and out of 10 things, if two things go, then that's pretty amazing. You know, it's it's always a constant, you know, unless you're, you know, Neil Simon or someone, you know, it's, it's always a, a, a uphill. Yes. Battle. Do I spy behind you an Emmy award, an actual real Emmy award? That's an Emmy award. And the other two are animation Emmys. Wow. There's a specific animation uh, Emmy as well. Those were for uh, Futurama. What's it yeah. feel like to receive those awards? Um, the Emmy was really interesting because we would be against the Simpsons every year and the Simpsons would always win. And I was just sitting there waiting for the Simpsons to be announced. And then when we, when I heard like, what? And I, you know, I just zoomed up to the stage and it was just this crazy, you know, my head was pounding and what was, what was sort of interesting and sort of, uh, a little, uh, bittersweet was, 
you know, my dad, like I said, was always, we were always connected through the comedy world and stuff like that. So uh, my, my dad had just passed away like four days before that. So it would have been a nice moment. You know, I, I kind of remember, you know, after I, I won later on, just kind of in the lobby of the place and kind of looking down, walking through the tuxedos and, you know, gowns and just kind of going off and having a private moment. It was a little, uh, you know, and it's funny, my mom, you know, is interesting because she doesn't really understand the business so much, you know, and you know, how could she, but you know, it's like, uh, like I created an animated show and the advertisement for it was on the side of a building on Sunset Boulevard. It was like, the, you know, a four story high. And she's like, you're, that's great. You're getting there. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, so when I won the Emmy, it was like the same thing. All right. Yes, you're going you're gonna to do good. I go, well, I don't know. Cool. You know, but it's sort of, you know, parents, you know, not letting the enemy of, you know, good get in the way of the en uh, enemy of great, you know, kind of thing. It's just a natural parental thing. So, yes. Never wanting us to get a big head. That was part of what we had to deal with growing yeah. up. Yep. Anytime that I would t be funnier than my father, like if we'd go to a restaurant and I'd make a wisecrack that would trump hit whatever he said, he would look over at me and call me the B word. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, he was a character. You know, I didn't, I didn't have the guts to do comedy when he was alive, but I know he's laughing from wherever he's at. Heaven, call it heaven. Yeah. Um, did that, did his attitude make you want to do it even more or less or? I didn't have the guts to do it when he was around because nothing would have ever been good enough. But once he passed away and I, that was right at the time that I became an empty nester. You know, I'd been a single mom most of my, you know, most of her life, I was a single mom with her. And when she was grown up and went on her own, I was like, I think, I think I want to live and have a lot of fun. And I think that means comedy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and especially when I did it, there was such a great camaraderie with the comics in New York city, you know, uh, hanging out at these awful bars in New York to, you know, like going in, I didn't know, like you pass auditions at the improv. I thought you just get on the improv every night, but I had realized there's dues you have to pay. You have to go to these crappy little bars, keep honing your craft and then work your way up to that stuff. But uh, I met a bunch of comics that I'm still friends with now, you know, from those days. We yeah. played a, there was a bar called the Triple Inn on 54th Street, right across from Studio 54. And it was like a bar, just like my dad's bar, you know, and uh, the audiences were typically like people who were rejected waiting online at Studio 54. They didn't get in. So they're in you know, this little shitty bar with their disco clothes on and, you know, drinking seven and sevens and just mad at the world. You know, they wanted to show their new disco moves and then they're stuck, you know, with some dopey kid like me trying to tell jokes. But it's good you know, it's like working out with weights, you know, you learn how to get laughs from those people, then, you know, you can almost get laughs anywhere. So it's good. It's just good training. Yes. One of my good friends now says he knows you from back in the day in New York, Steve Marshall. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's become a good friend. He believes in my comedy. Steve was a great guy. He was always a really good spirit. Um, I seem to remember we would play basketball once in a while, maybe in the middle of the night down in Washington Square, not Washington Square, uh, uh, West West Fourth Street, there was basketball courts and it'd be like middle of the night, nobody's playing. I think at least once or twice we, we did that. Um, yeah, New York City was great, even though it was, it was right in the crack infested, you know, uh, prostitutes and, you know, but as a kid, I, you know, it didn't matter to me. I was 20 or whatever, you know, it was, it was sort of cool in a way. And I, and I, I, 
I kind of like the those days now than what I, what's there now. You know, it's sort of Times Square is just like a mall that you can yeah. go anywhere, and it's those same stores. You know. Yeah. But back then it was like you know. Uh, in fact, you know, when I moved to New York, uh, I had my training, my uh, background, and, and so I got a job at this place at an audiovisual repair and rental place. Um, we fixed projectors and stuff like that. It was in the Ed Sullivan Theater building, in fact, where Letterman later it became his offices, but in those offices above there. And uh, so one day, uh, the guy, the boss puts on my desk two 16 millimeter movie reels. And I go, what's this? And he goes, you have to, you have to transfer these to beta tape. The customer wants it for his home library. And it was the movie Woodstock, right? This was, so this was 80, there was nobody had videos or anything. And I go, who has like a video set up in their house? And he said, it was Martin Scorsese. And I go, what, he want, what? And he goes, yeah, Martin Scorsese was an editor on the movie Woodstock, I didn't know that. So he wants it for his home projector and he wants you to bring it down there to his apartment and adjust it into his TV for him, make sure it plays well. And I'm like, holy shit, I'm gonna go to Scorsese's. And I go to his apartment somewhere and try back up, 20th floor or whatever. And there is Scorsese, he enters the door, you know, in his 80s, you know, bell bottom pants and the shirt and the vest. And it's like, you got it. It's like a drug deal, you got it. Yeah, I got the, and uh, so, I'm, uh, he has one of those old school clamshell video screens and I'm like behind there adjusting it. And he's like directing me. It's like, oh, I'm being directed by Scorsese. He's like, little on the top, it's on the, like, you can't, you can't. And I'm like nervous kid, like adjusting it. And, uh, and I, but I had to ask, like I said, how, you know, how do you have all these movies? There's no video markets or anything. And he's like, you like, so you like movies? And I'm like, well, yeah, of course. And he took me into this library and it was floor to ceiling of beta tapes of movies that were all bootleg. They had like, you know, a white tape with just magic marker, but it was like, you know, Fritz Lang and it was like every cool movie. So he showed me what he did was he had a stack of TV guides from all the major markets around the country, big cities. And he had people hired in all these cities um, and he would look through the, like, oh, in Philly, uh, Casablanca is on at 8.30. So he would call his guy and say, record it. And then the guy would mail it to him. And that's how he built his first movie library. Um, <laughs> but that was pretty cool to be in on that, to see the inside of uh, yeah. Scorsese's little world. So we can follow you on Facebook. We can buy your book on Amazon. It's a funny thing. I have a couple of uh, shows running on Netflix. I don't know if anybody's interested. One is uh, yes. one's called The Trailer Park Boys. Trailer Park Boys. And then there's uh, Paradise PD. Uh, they're both animated shows. Paradise uh, PD. Yeah, those are the more recent. But I, you know, I got all my reruns of Futurama running on Netflix and. I was there for like seven seasons and uh, I was at Family Guy for one season, but Family Guy could be found if people want to see that stuff, you know. Do you uh, have a YouTube with things on it? Uh, not really. Okay. I guess I should, right? <laughs> it, it doesn't hurt, you know, but it doesn't mean anything if you don't have it. It's like you've got your stuff on Netflix. Most people only have it on YouTube. So I think you might have surpass the need for YouTube. Yeah. And uh, also, if people are interested on, uh, I think it's on Hulu. It was on Netflix. I did a documentary about the 50th anniversary of the improv. No way. Uh, so it's Larry David and Richard Lewis and the Waynes brothers and Kathy Griffin and Sarah Silverman, uh, Ray Romano, Bill Maher. And uh, I got them to really, as much as I could talk about, do the kind of the, the my Kind of stories of sort of these intimate stories of moments and stuff that happened when they were there. Seinfeld is on it and Jimmy Fallon and um, so I, I was really proud of that. It, it was something I always wanted to do I thought that I would do a documentary about the improv but 
when they somehow found me, so because I, I always thought if I wanted to do it, I'd have to pay for it myself and everything. But then they somehow found me, and and they, it was I think Epics paid for it, so I didn't have to invest any of my own money. So, so I had a blast with that. Um, it was a lot of it is home movies that I shot when I was you know twenty at the Improv and in Comedy Cellar and stuff like that. So you see just young shots of. Sarah and Jay Moore and you know uh and Ray Romano you know uh so it's pretty cool I'm proud of it well congratulations on all your accomplishments Thank yeah you. I would say there's no need for you to be on YouTube that's for us hungry striving people not for people with an Emmy and two animation awards oh, well a lot of work it's always it's always about the work you know yes. and keep working and keep working and having a lot on your plate just so something comes through right yeah yeah you have to work on as many things as possible <laughs> you've been so inspiring to me i'm going to go see about buying your book okay and if it's under 25 30 dollars i'll buy one it's ten thousand dollars but you get nice pictures <laughs> nice um, I, I found a um, a ventriloquist dummy of Charlie McCarthy at a thrift store one day. Hmm. So I drug it up to an open mic when I was first starting out and it was a broken doll. So I got it for cheap. And so um, I made up this joke that like the, the dummy doesn't work. I'm the dummy. I got to do the just typical, you know, the woman does all the work, you know. Uh -huh. And then I said, so I but I wrote a book. Um, and my book is, you know, it's on Amazon. It's kind of expensive. It's a thousand dollars, but um, good news. It's only got one page, uh, one paragraph, one paragraph. Um, yeah. And the paragraph says, you're the dummy. <laughs> Who's the dummy now? You bought the book. It's the title of the book. I got it mixed up. The title of the book is ventriloquism dot, dot, dot for the dummies. Oh, that's funny. You know what? You know what's weird. I did on the evening at the Improv. I said, you know, as a kid, I used to do ventriloquism, and I haven't done it since I was a kid. But I'd like to kind of bring it full circle and do it tonight. I haven't done it forever. And I signal someone off stage. Can you? The dummy is in the bag. Can you bring me the? And I set it up where they threw the bag, and just bounces off the stage. And it was preset. And I take the dummy out, and like what you did. The dummy is broken. The mouth is hanging out. So I, I kind of did the same thing where I played the panic of like, um, were you telling me something funny earlier? He's like, oh, he can't talk. And then he has to whisper the joke to me. And, uh, and then I have to do the setup and punchline and, you know. Uh, the so starting on my dummy was broke, right? So when you go to make them out, nothing happened. So I said, yeah. I mean, it worked fine at home. Well, it made the lights flash and then a really old tampon fell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's good. You can have fun with a broken dummy, right? Yeah. Yep. That's funny. So I'll go buy your book. Okay. I'm sure, I'm sure it's in the right price range for me. It sounds like a great book for motivational speaking. It is. It's all about facing your fears. Uh, fighting the good fights, taking on big challenges, and the reward that you get on the other side of it, you know. Um, so yeah, it could be inspirational for all who want to, you know, chase their wildest dreams. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, you've been so great to come back on and anytime you want to come back to plug anything, promote, I'll, I'm here for you. You can come back once. Nobody takes me up on it. You can come back once a month and plug something. All right. Sounds great. Thank you, Mike Rowe. Okay, thank you. Is there anything that I didn't say that you want to cover? No, I think we went above and beyond. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, thank you. Bye. Bye.